webinar series, providing you with timely information and training each month on topics of interest. This is Brendan Burnett, Director of Professional Development and Education Programs. Today we are presenting Steer Clients Clear of These Common Retirement Planning Mistakes, during which our presenter will identify and explain the top 10 retirement planning mistakes and how to avoid them. With me today is Kristen McKenzie. An associate professor at the College for Financial Planning, Kristen has over 20 years of experience in the financial services industry, both as an active financial planner and as a provider of financial education. She graduated from the University of Connecticut with a degree in economics and later received her MBA at the University of Colorado. Prior to joining the college, Kristen worked at TIAA CREF. You can contact Kristen at kristen.mckenzie at cffp.edu. During today's webinar, Kristen will show you how to help clients avoid the mistakes that can make the difference between financial independence and needing to return to work. Kristen will show you how to avoid common retirement planning pitfalls, including making decisions out of fear, failing to plan for longevity, making poor investment decisions, and much more. Kristen and I would like today's presentation to be interactive and encourage you to type your questions on the question box on the right side of your screen at any time during the presentation. Questions will be answered throughout the webinar and during a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So let's begin. Kristen, I'll turn the discussion to you. Hi, thank you, Brendan. Thanks for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak with your group today. I really appreciate it. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining me for today's session on the top 10 retirement planning mistakes. As Brenda indicated, my name is Kristen McKenzie. I'm an associate professor at the College for Financial Planning. I have worked here for almost a year teaching retirement planning, and before that I was a financial planner with TIAA CREF for a long time. I'm not going to give away how long. Um, I'm available by phone at the number on your screen or by email. And as Brendan indicated, I really encourage you to ask any questions during this session um, just to make it more interesting for both you and me. Let's go ahead and get started. How many of you know someone who is making periodic contributions to their IRA and think that they are all set with the retirement planning? Probably most of you do, and in fact, these folks are not prepared for retirement. Financial planning for retirement is a challenging process. It involves a lot of thinking about the future and a lot of guesswork, and that's really where your job as a financial planner is to educate them about the idea that there's much more to retirement planning than just funding an IRA. What I have for you today is a discussion of the top 10 retirement planning mistakes I have seen clients make time and time again. And making even one of these mistakes can be the difference between achieving financial independence in retirement and having to pinch pennies or return to work. Let's get started with a savings rule that we are all probably familiar with, but many clients tend to ignore, and that is don't delay, start saving now. When you are young and you have your first, quote, real job, the last thing on your mind is probably retirement savings, or even retirement as a concept. Then before you know it, you're 30 and you have a mortgage and a couple of kids, you've probably considered saving for retirement at this point, but can barely make ends meet as it is. By the time you're in your 40s and 50s, retirement is becoming very real, yet there are many reasons to put off saving. You might have kids in college and other numerous excuses. So people assume they can hold off on saving for retirement and they'll just be able to make up the difference later. They figure that they will start saving for retirement after other big obligations such as a home loan and children education are paid for. This can be a costly mistake because you're giving up one of the most important savings tools available, time. Compounding interest really does have power because each little gain generates 
further returns and your money will grow exponentially over time. The Center for Retirement Research estimates that an individual starting at age 25 will have to save 15% of their income until age 65 to achieve an 80% income replacement rate. So that's 15% for a 25 year old. That savings rate jumps to 24% for those who start at age 35 and 41% for 45 year olds. I myself am rapidly approaching age 45 and I know that I do not have 41% of my income available for savings. In fact, I don't think most people do. Certainly it's never too late to start, but waiting too long to start saving can make it very difficult to catch up. Delaying even just a few short years can make a big difference in how much you'll accumulate at the end. Looking at it another way, to reach a million dollars in retirement savings by age 65, you would need to save $361 a month beginning at age 20. Delay until age 30 and the contribution rate more than doubles. By starting early, reaching your retirement goal can mean saving as little as a few dollars a day, and it can be as simple as eliminating trips to the vending machine or that fancy coffee drink each morning. I'll tell you, I personally just gave up a nasty Diet Coke habit. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to quit Diet Coke, but it's really hard. Um, I figure I was spending oh, seven or eight dollars a day on Diet Coke, not to mention ruining my health. So I'm thinking that if I can save that money for the next 20 years and invest it at 6%, I will have accumulated nearly $100,000, which isn't a bad addition to my retirement fund. So retirement savings is really all about establishing priorities and making choices, and there will always be hard choices to make. As you all know, every stage of life has financial challenges, and there's never going to be an ideal time to start. But what we as advisors need to be educating our young clients about is that they really can't afford to wait. They should start by investing in their company's 401k and an IRA. At the very, very least, they should be investing enough to get the company match, what we're all used to calling free money. Then they should set up their plan so that the contribution rate increases annually or with each raise. Most folks who have done the math place the recommended savings contribution rates between 15 and 18 percent of earned income. And incidentally, that number is higher for women who have a longer lifespan. Unfortunately, these percentages are far in excess of what the average person is actually saving. So our message to them needs to be start early and save aggressively. Number nine, with a shift away from defined benefit plans that had a guaranteed lifetime income toward defined contributions that are often cashed out at retirement, Retirees are increasingly responsible for managing their own portfolio up until and then through retirement. This is a difficult proposition and it seems that when saving for retirement, people tend to take too much risk or too little risk. Those whose portfolio is too, risk are, is too risky often are investing aggressively in an effort to make up for lost time. The too risky group also includes those who hold concentrated positions in their employer stock. Just as a rule of thumb, as you near retirement, your goal should be to hold no more than 5 to 10 percent of your portfolio in any one stock. Despite what clients think, they're not smarter than the market and sticking with single stocks is a big gamble. On the flip side, so we have the people that are too risky, we also have people that don't think that they need to invest in stocks at all. A recent survey by Franklin Templeton found that a third of long-term investors believe they can get by without investing in stocks. Sure that mitigates investment risk, but think about inflation and longevity. Certainly it's not advantageous for those risks. And being overinvested in bonds in retirement 
really won't generate the income you need to make your savings last longer than you do because of the power of inflation. Consider that even in retirement, your time horizon is still long term, maybe 20, 30 years or more, and inflation will have a bigger impact during retirement than it did during your working years. So work with your clients to create an investment policy statement. Such a policy should outline the amount of risk you want to take, state your asset allocation guidelines, establish a formula for evaluating investment performance, and outline your time horizon for major goals, including retirement. Studies show that 91% of a portfolio's performance is linked to asset allocation. So that leaves only 9% that's linked to se selection of specific securities and market timing. So having the right asset allocation is key. Number eight, the impact of early withdrawals and plan loans. This is one that I'm seeing more and more and it's really unfortunate. It's estimated that more than one quarter of American workers with 401k and other retirement savings accounts are rating these accounts prior to retirement to pay for current expenses. So things like groceries and rent. Taking an in-service distribution can be tempting, but should be done only as a very last resort. Amounts withdrawn are subject to income tax, likely an early distribution penalty, and most plans impose restrictions on contributions for up to a year after an individual takes a hardship withdrawal. Most importantly, of course, when you take an early withdrawal, you are spending the very money that you need to grow. Early withdrawals are often taken after a job loss, the onset of poor health, after a divorce, sometimes for the purchase of a new home. But instead of taking an early distribution following a change of employment, encourage your clients to roll their money over to an IRA and to keep their funds invested and growing. As we saw in the previous slide, even a small accumulation can grow to a substantial sum over time. Almost as bad as taking an early withdrawal is taking a loan from your 401k. People think, so what's the big deal? I'm borrowing from myself. I'm getting a great interest rate, there's no credit check, and I'll pay myself back. Not so quick though. There are a number of reasons why you should encourage your clients not to take a 401k loan. First, consider the opportunity cost or the loss of growth potential on the borrowed money. Also, because there's now a loan payment that you need to make, the temptation is often to reduce the amount being contributed to the plan which only further reduces long-term retirement account balances. Second, remember that even the interest rate, remember that even if the interest rate seems appealing, it's still being paid and it's not tax deductible. And to make things worse, something that people don't often think about, is repayments must be made from after-tax money even though the funds will be taxed again upon distribution in retirement. Finally, following termination of employment, a full loan repayment is likely required in order to avoid default. Default is a taxable event, and if you are under age 59 and a half, you may also be hit with a 10% early withdrawal penalty. As you can see, taking a loan, especially to meet everyday living expenses, is likely to put your client in even a worse position over the long term. Number seven, I want to talk about retiring too early, something you might not consider to be a big mistake, but often is. The average retirement age in the United States is anywhere from age 62 to 64 for men and 60 to 62 for women. Compare this with 100 years ago when most people worked their whole lives. I mean, when you consider increasing longevity, most retirees today spend more time in retirement than they do planning for it. 
And while early retirement may sound appealing, it brings with it a number of risks that go way beyond the possibility of an early withdrawal penalty. Early retirement is really a sort of double whammy. Okay? First, you have less time to save and will likely retire with less money. If you have a pension plan, your benefit will be reduced. If you start Social Security before full retirement age, you'll earn a permanently reduced benefit. Also remember, if you retire before age 65, you can't take advantage of Medicare right away. And if you don't have other current coverage in the interim, you will need to find a source to cover your medical needs while you wait Medicare eligibility. And this can be quite expensive, and clients need to be thinking about including that in their retirement budget. So we see that retiring early can result in less savings. Don't forget, though, that your savings need will increase due to the additional years that your savings will need to cover. Some estimate that for every year you continue to work between age 62 and 70, you increase your probability of success in retirement by a full 10%. I think that's a really startling number. So you may want to encourage your clients to slow down and reconsider their ability to retire. If it depends on, if success in retirement depends on their ability to work again, should the need arise, that's not a safe bet. Keep in mind that your health may not always allow for this. And it may be difficult for retirees to keep up with the skills and technical expertise required to return to work. You may also want to reconsider early retirement if you are counting on market growth to sustain you or you are unprepared for unexpected medical expenses. Finally, money aside, there are a number of other reasons why early retirement may not be all it's cracked up to be. Studies have linked early retirement with negative health effects, even increased risk of divorce and premature death. So you want to be encouraging your clients to develop a routine and stay engaged. I think number six, not knowing your number, is one of the most important things that you should be discussing with your clients. How many of you have seen the commercial for a financial services firm asking if you know, quote, your number? Okay, your number is the daunting amount, be it 500,000 or a million or two million, that you will need to accumulate to maintain your lifestyle in retirement. Most people don't know their number. In fact, surveys estimate that less than half of prospective retirees have tried to determine how much money they'll need to live on once their paychecks stop. The number is going to be large, that's for sure, and for many it will be shocking and overwhelming, but it's really hard to make a plan if you don't know what your ultimate goal is. So start by talking to your clients about their vision of retirement, their goals and values. Have them picture a day in retirement. Will it involve pure leisure and hobbies, or maybe some volunteer work, or consulting, or a part-time job? Think about where they plan on living, whether they want to leave money for their kids. Then have them create a retirement budget. Budgeting shouldn't be thought of as a punishment or an unwelcome chore. Remember, creating a budget will help you prevent, help prevent future worry putting a plan into place to avoid unnecessary concern down the road. People tend to assume that their expenses will drop dramatically in retirement, but most will be quite surprised if they do the math. Think about it. When do you spend the most money? For me, it's on Saturday. And once I retire, every day is going to be a Saturday. Travel, golf, hobbies, dining out, increasing medical expenses, these things will add up more quickly than you probably realize, making your post-retirement income needs just about equal to your needs prior to retirement. At TIAA CREF, they did a study that found that 56% of people thought their expenses would decrease in retirement. Only 31% actually did, and 22% actually saw an increase in spending.
Once you have a good picture of your client's income needs, you can then transition to a discussion of the money that will be needed to meet their goals. Obviously, we don't have concrete numbers to put into our equation. For example, we don't know how long a particular client will live, what unexpected medical expenses will crop up, or what inflation will look like. We can get pretty close, though, and it's an exercise worth doing. Clients will likely be much more interested in making and following a plan after seeing the reality of the amount needed to support their lifestyle in retirement. And remember, this is not a one-shot deal. You and your client should revisit their plan on a regular basis, especially as they start getting closer to retirement. Number five, failing to plan for longevity. As we've just seen, one of the biggest challenges in estimated your, estimating your needed retirement savings amount is that you don't know how long you're going to live. I'm sure you've all seen the figures pointing to the average life expectancy for males and females. You need to always remember, though, those are just averages. Half of your clients are going to live longer. And when planning, it is important that you take this into account or half your clients could run out of money before they die. It is true that people are generally living longer. One in four 65-year-olds will live past age 90, one in 10 past 95. While this is positive in that, in that it gives individuals greater opportunity to travel, spend time with family, and volunteer, on the other side, it increases one's risk of running out of money prior to death. While this risk can't be completely eliminated, it can be planned for and managed through a variety of techniques, financial products, and planning strategies. First, it's obvious that when you are doing retirement planning, you're going to need to make an educated choice about an uncertain retirement period. Typically, clients are encouraged to plan for age 90 or even 95. Even better, though, is coming up with a personalized life expectancy, which means taking a look at individual family history, life habits, and health status. For example, are you a smoker or not? Do you exercise? Are you overweight? Do you have high blood pressure? Second, it's your job as a financial planner to help your clients take advantage of products and strategies specifically designed to mitigate longevity risk or the risk of outliving their money. One common strategy for all types of retirement, I'm sorry, all types of risk management is to transfer it to a third party. Transferring the risk of living too long can be accomplished by acquiring or increasing sources of lifetime income. Consider deferring receipt of Social Security benefits past full retirement age. Social Security is essentially an inflation-protected lifetime annuity, and the longer you wait to begin payments, the larger the payments will be up until age 70. Take advantage of annuities. Instead of taking a lump sum distribution from your employer-sponsored plan, elect to receive a lifetime annuity over your lifetime or that of your spouse, you and your spouse. Finally, life insurance contracts can be used for the same purpose. Reverse mortgages, rental income, dividend paying stock, these are all sources of income that are payable for an indefinite period of time, which can allow you to provide for longevity risk without specifically having to set aside the assets for the sole purpose of lifetime income. Something that is discussed often in recent years is how to construct a game plan regarding when to take distributions from your investments and from which investments you should draw first. This involves a discussion of which plans to draw down and choosing a sustainable drawdown rate. Managing your client's retirement funds is really a balancing act between spending too little and needlessly needlessly restricting their lifestyle and spending too much and running the risk of running out of money. 
I'm sure you've all been expecting number four, ignoring potential health costs. It is not inflation or market performance that presents the biggest risk to your retirement plan. It's unexpected medical expenses. More than 81% of respondents to a recent survey said that they worry about being able to afford health care in retirement, and 68% of respondents said that they'll go bankrupt, that they worry they'll go bankrupt paying for medical bills following illness or accident. Unfortunately, these fears are not all that invalid. The best way to ensure that future health care costs don't consume your savings is to determine with a reasonable degree of accuracy how much you may need and to incorporate that into your retirement plan. That figure is obviously going to fluctuate based on your health, your lifestyle, and your family history. And it also varies depending on who's crunching the numbers. Fidelity Investments, for example, has been tracking retiree health costs for more than a decade. And it estimates that a 65-year-old couple retiring this year will need $240,000 to cover future medical costs. And that doesn't even include the high cost of long-term care. Fidelity's estimate of $240,000 includes the cost of deductibles and co-pays, premiums for optional coverage for doctor's visits, prescription drugs, and other expenses that Medicare doesn't cover, such as hearing aids and eyeglasses. Even if you face no other costs, these premiums and deductibles can quickly eat up your retirement savings. Then, of course, comes the cost associated with long-term care, whether it be home care, assisted living, or nursing care. Many retirees believe that Medicare covers long-term care, but this is a very important misunderstanding. For a 65-year-old, the chance of needing some form of long-term care by age 75 is about 15% for both men and women. These percentages rise dramatically by age 85, and for those who survive until age 90, men have a 70% chance of using care at some point, and women have a 77% chance. So it's not a stretch to say that your chances of needing some sort of long-term care are very good. And with 50% of claims lasting more than one year, these costs add up quickly. Now whether it's advisable to buy long-term care insurance or build up a self-insurance fund to self-insure will vary from person to person depending on their available cash flow. But the bottom line is that as you move toward retirement, you need to have some sort of plan in place to cover long-term care costs. Let's talk about Social Security. This is one of my favorite retirement planning topics, and I know it's coming up more and more with clients. Social Security is quite possibly the best retirement deal out there. It provides a monthly benefit for life regardless of market performance, and it's indexed for inflation. So people who have the tendency to seek the security of a regular check coming in tend to start their benefits at age 62. In fact, more than half of all Americans start their benefits at age 62, which is the earliest possible date or age with the lowest possible benefit, a permanently reduced benefit. And unfortunately, most end up regretting this decision to start early. There are many factors that go into the decision of when to initiate Social Security benefits, including life expectancy, the level of the benefits, whether you are still receiving earned income, and the impact on your spouse and any available survivor benefits. Of course, some people have no choice but to start their benefits early due to lack of savings and the recent recession. Many seniors are faced with working longer and are struggling to pay for necessities such as health care. Additionally, fixed income rates on savings are as low as they've been in 60 years, something that's not likely to change in the short term. 
For most people, though, it pays to delay taking benefits in order to make your income as large as possible and to give you the highest likelihood of achieving the best long-term personal outcome. Remember that for every year you delay receipt of benefits between age 66 and 70, you will earn a guaranteed 8% increase in your benefit. Over a lifetime, this could mean $100,000 in additional benefits or more. So about the only case where I can see that it would make sense not to wait is if you have a strong indication that you won't live past your early 80s, which tends to be the break-even point for most. But with life expectancies increasing so much in recent years, unless you're in poor health, your chances are good. If you're married, the decision about your Social Security claiming strategy becomes even more complex. The optimal strategy will depend on your ages, your expected longevities, and the relative earnings history of each spouse. Luckily, there are a lot of programs out there that can assist you with doing the analysis for your clients. The bottom line regarding Social Security is that it's a complicated system that most clients and actually many planners have a limited understanding of. So I encourage you to take the time to educate yourself about the different Social Security maximization strategies available to your clients. Number two, failing to have the talk. Right now, I'm in the middle of having, quote, the talk with my young girls. You know, the one about the birds and the bees? But just as importantly, I should be having another talk with my parents. While this second talk is focused on planning for long-term care, medical decisions, and the distribution of money and property, it can be just as uncomfortable. And it forces you to consider end-of-life issues that you may not want to face making it an easy conversation to avoid. The reality is that few have had any discussion regarding these topics with their adult children, parents, or even their spouse. The National Hospice Foundation has found that 75% of Americans don't make their end-of-life decisions known to their families. And only 55% of adult children have talked to their parents about what the plan's going to be if the parent can no longer live independently. Silence, however, is not golden, as they say. In fact, not having proactive discussions around medical and financial issues that arise later in life can be detrimental to your client's wishes for their old age. One's family needs to know how they plan on financing their future, what their living arrangements will be, how they'll get medical care, and how they want things to go at the end of their life. A will or trust is perhaps the most important document you need. It should spell out how your estate will be handled and who will inherit your assets. Your kids need to know where to find it and how to interpret it. You also need a durable health care power of attorney and a living will. So a durable health care power of attorney allows your designated person to make health care decisions on your behalf if you become incapacitated. And a living will details end of life wishes, such as do not resuscitate and things along those lines. Finally, your kids need to be able to contact your advisors to take care of financial matters and they need to know your funeral and burial wishes. It's interesting, in doing some reading on this topic for today's session, I realized that most books on the subject of end-of-life issues are written for children facing a parental health crisis. But we shouldn't let it get to that. You shouldn't wait until someone you care about gets sick or dies. So encourage your clients to have the conversation now, and maybe you even want to help them get started by offering to facilitate the conversation. What I think is the number one mistake people make is that they make decisions out of a lack of understanding or out of fear. A 2013 survey by Nationwide Insurance found that in general, 
consumers are more afraid of skydiving than investing in the stock market. <laughs> That's the good news. The bad news, however, is that they are equally afraid of investing as they are of dying. The three most common financial fears are that there will, that there will be another financial crisis, the inability to finance children's education, and that their own health costs will become unmanageable. Fear-based decisions don't always turn out to be the best. Fear makes people, frankly, do dumb things, like selling at the bottom of a market cycle. Financial decisions should be based on financial planning principles, such as asset allocation, not your client's fears. Your client may be so overwhelmed by the vast amount of information and options out there that they're inclined not even to start with their planning. The study of behavioral finance indicates that financial education and literacy is essential to helping people focus on planning for the future. So instead of trying to scare your clients into what their retirement picture would look like if they stay on their current path, try a different approach. Try instead to highlight the great possibilities ahead if they make even small incremental changes beginning today. So that is my list of the top 10 retirement planning mistakes you should be working with your clients to avoid. It's, it's by no means an exhaustive list and you may have a number of other risks to add to it. My point though was to illustrate that most Americans do not have the financial ability required to manage all the risks that come with retirement planning. Couple this with the fact that long-term planning is not a skill many possess. It's hard to think about the future. To meet these challenges, a sound retirement plan is required, and building this plan isn't necessarily a do-it-yourself project, and that's why your clients are relying on you for help. So that's what I had for you today, and I certainly would welcome any questions or comments or does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Thanks, Kristen. We actually already do have a few questions, and I okay. want to remind all of our participants you can type any additional questions in the question box on the right side of your screen. Uh, between 15% and 18% savings rate, for which age range? That's the first question. And then there's a follow-up question. Can you review the recommended savings rates for different ages? You mentioned needing mm -hmm. to save 41% of income at 60 or thereabouts. What were those numbers? So kind of the whole range, please. Okay. So this was a Center for Retirement Research study that indicated for an individual starting at age 25, they will have to save 15% of their income until age 65 to achieve an 80% income replacement rate in retirement. So 15% for a 25-year-old, and that jumps to 24% for an individual who delays until age 35, and 41% for 45-year-olds. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I want to remind all of our participants that we uh, did have another webinar done not too long ago on uh, Social Security that went very in-depth on just Social Security planning. So uh, Kristen certainly uh, touched on that during her presentation, but if you'd like in more information, I invite you to look up that webinar also. Okay. We have another question concerning the uh, early withdrawal from a 401k or more specifically taking a loan from a 401k. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're paying uh, back uh, the principal plus interest, of course, when you take out that loan. The, the interest you're paying is also going to yourself, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Excellent. Yes. Not that that's a good idea, but... <laughs> No. We have a question, actually two questions. Can we get a copy of the presentation emailed to us? Can you please send us a copy of the slides and the recording? And I'll go ahead and uh, answer those questions. The okay. presentation is being recorded, and we're going to be sending an automated email out within two business days to all of our participants today. And that email is going to contain a web link that will take you directly to the recorded 
presentation. Uh, in terms of receiving the slides themselves, um, I'll defer to Kristen on that one. Oh, certainly. I'd be happy to make those available. And Brendan, you have those if you want to, if you have an email list or if you'd rather have people email me and I can send them individually, whatever works best. Perfect. Well, I'll go ahead and email out the slides to all of our participants today. Okay, great. All right. And uh, the next question, what is the average number of years someone stays in a long-term care facility? Well, that's a good question. I'm not sure if I know the answer to that. I know um, it's certainly in the one to two year range, but with Alzheimer's and things like that, there's certainly a, a room for that to increase greatly. And I'll put our NAFA research staff on that right now and yeah. hopefully we'll have an answer okay. by the end of the presentation. <laughs> okay. Uh, the next question, and we have a number coming in, which is great. Um, what about the reduction in cognitive ability that most folks experience after their early 70s, according to recent studies, and how that Im impacts financial decision making? Mm -hmm. Well, there's certainly that plays into it, and I think that has a lot to do with why people should plan prior to that as far as putting in power of attorneys and getting their ducks in a row. Excellent. Can you recommend programs that help predict life expectancy on the basis of health, medical history, etc.? Mm -hmm. The one that I like the best is called livingto100.com and it's a lot more interactive than the Social Security one, for example, because it does take into account family history, health, habits, etc. Great. And what was that one more time, Kristen, the name of that site? It's called Living to 100, the number 100.com. Living to, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And the next question, Oh, that's so nice. Outstanding. Thank you very much. This is a huge presentation. Many thanks. Okay. And uh, we have someone who has volunteered the answer to the average long-term care stay, uh, oh, and good. they say approximately two and a half years. So, two and a half years. Okay. Yes. Thank you for that. Uh, the next, another answer, 29 months, so pretty, definitely pretty much the same. Yeah. Um, and let's see even more specific, 2.3 years for non-cognitive nursing home admissions. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. Um, what is the best plan for clients that are 50 plus with no significant retirement savings? Well, that gets tough because those individuals really are going to be retire relying primarily on Social Security, but as I indicated, trying to put that off as long as possible by using your personal um, resources is certainly the most um, advantageous way to go. I mean, you need to look at any other assets they may have, such as their house. They need to talk about downsizing, the possibility of um, I read articles recently about people moving in with or getting roommates, etc., just structuring their life in a completely different way. It's it's pretty unfortunate. Like anything else, like running a business, you have to either earn it or borrow it, and at that point, you're not going to be borrowing it. You're going to be need, needing to earn it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, we don't have any additional questions at this point, so we're going to okay. pause um, just for a moment to see if there's any question in the pipeline that's okay. about to come in. And um, as I mentioned, I'll be emailing you the slides, and you'll also be receiving a web link that will allow you to go right to the recorded presentation. And, uh, well, this is a good problem to have because we're going to let you be able to uh, go a little early today. 
uh, you best <laughs> your businesses. And so uh, I want to thank uh, all of our participants today for spending some time uh, learning more about this vitally important topic, uh, a topic that increasingly becoming more and more important, of course. And I want to especially thank our presenter. Thank you, Kristen. And uh, I want to remind everyone that to access today's presentation, please use the web link provided in the automated email you'll be receiving. That's a different email than the email that you'll be receiving from me with a PowerPoint slide presentation attached to it. Uh, this concludes the NAFA webinar. Good day.